Okay, everyone should be muted right now, so I can't hear you. Um, if you do have a question, I've got Jen Megan here who's monitoring the chat box, um, and then I can unmute periodically um, if we wanna have uh, some discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome and thank you for joining me today, uh, day two of our online virtual summit. If you've been on any of the other um, activities we've had, I hope you've been finding them enjoyable and helpful. Today I'm doing the food safety course. Uh, I've been doing this in person for a few months now, uh, but I've been wanting to get it online and virtual because I know that's sometimes a much easier way for people to access it. So I'm actually doing two trainings combined in one. So, and I will say this again a little bit later in case this gets confusing or people are missing this beginning part, but I'm going through a food safety for pantries specifically in the beginning. Uh, because for pantry workers, you don't necessarily need to know the same information that someone who's actually cooking and preparing food would need to know in terms of food safety. So I'm going to, the first about 75% of this course is applicable to everybody. It's basic food safety, but a little bit more specific for pantries. Uh, and then the remaining portion of the training will deal more specifically with food prep in terms of cooking temperatures, how to take a temperature, how to thaw food. Now that would be specific to people who work with meal prep. Uh, if you're a soup kitchen, a shelter, a snack program, you, your food safety requirement includes these additional items. Now, if you're a pantry worker and you'd like to stay on and, and view the remainder of it, you're more than welcome to, but your requirements are not um, as extensive in terms of food safety. So it will be up to you. If you wanna either take the pantry quiz and log off, that would be just fine. If you want to stay on and view the remainder of it, that's fine as well, but you're, you're not needing to know that additional information. Okay, so what I'm doing today is a food safety class that's adapted from Feeding America and, and that Serve Safe uh, training, if you've been through that or heard about that. The requirement is that at all times, there's going to be at least one staff member or volunteer who oversees food safety at an agency. It can certainly be more than one who is trained, and actually that's great if as many staff people as you'd like to have trained, the more the better, but our requirement is just that there's one at all times. So pantry and on-site staff must take this basic food safety or another approved food safety training, such as the serve safe. Now these basic ones are good for three years. It'll get you an internal certificate from Feedmore saying that you've completed the training. If you opt to take serve safe, which I will be offering some classes later this month or early November. ServeSafe is recognized nationally and that's actually good for um, five years. So we're gonna to cover topics, personal hygiene and hand washing, safe food receiving, safe food storage, talking about expiration dates, um, proper cleaning, sanitizing, and pest control. And then that's where it'll end for pantry workers. The additional topics that I'll continue on with that are more for meal prep sites will be how to thaw food properly, preparing and cooking food safely, serving food safely, cooling and reheating food. So just to start off with, we're going to talk about how food becomes unsafe and why this is so important. Um, I'm a big food safety nerd. I think Jen is as well. <laughs> so we actually are happy to be teaching this class and excited to be giving this information. It's important though for anybody who's handling food in any capacity and providing it to people, to the public, that we understand why it's so important that we always maintain a safe environment for our food. Um, the CDC estimates that foodborne illness sickens about 48 million people in this country every year, a large number resulting in about 128,000 hospitalizations and 3,000 deaths per year. Now it's likely that everybody at some point has probably had an issue with you know, we call, used to call it food poisoning. And I think most of us can think back to a time where we're like, oh yeah, I think that uh, chicken I ate last night didn't quite agree with me. And we've gotten over it and just kind of moved on with our lives. You know, the important thing to remember is that some high risk populations, such as the elderly, very young children, people with compromised immune systems, uh, it's not always so easy for them to recover from such an illness. And these are the populations that we're most concerned about. So what is a foodborne illness? That's the more technical term, like so we used to call it food poisoning, or I think we still do, but the more technical term that the CDC and other uh, organizations use is a foodborne illness, which is simply a disease transmitted to people from food, through food. So how does the food become unsafe? 
Um, does it just naturally, you know, pop up this way and we eat it and we get sick? There's a number of ways that food can become unsafe. One of what we refer to as hazards, biological, chemical, or physical contaminants that affect food, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail. Another way is through time and temperature abuse, which I'll also discuss further, cross-contamination, poor cleaning and sanitation, and poor personal hygiene. So I'm going to go through all of these topics one by one. So we say hazards to food that make it unsafe. We've got three. One is called biological hazards. So this is things like bacteria, like your E. coli, salmonella. We probably all heard about these things in the news um, that occasionally can affect a food. Um, unfortunately, sometimes affect a large quantity of food that the public is purchasing. And that's when it's definitely a concern. Other things that can affect food are, are viruses. Now, when I say virus, I'm not talking about corona right now. This uh, training was actually designed pre-coronavirus, so talking about viruses like norovirus, uh, anybody remembers from quite a few years ago when a whole bunch of people on a cruise ship got ill from the norovirus, which they actually started calling the cruise ship virus for a little while there, and it was because someone uh, working on the cruise ship in the food, uh, food service program apparently had it, spread it, and because when you're trapped on a cruise ship and you're all eating off the same buffet, you're all going to get it. Uh, another virus would be hepatitis, um, uh, hepatitis A, which can also transmit through food. Other biological things are parasites, as disgusting as that sounds, that's unfortunately sometimes a thing, uh, and fungi, a little less harmful. Uh, the issue here is a lot of these can cause illness, some mild, some very severe. That second slide there is showing uh, physical hazards to food. This is when we drop something in a food that we're serving to somebody that's not supposed to be there. Uh, this sort of Christmas ornament thing here in the picture is supposed to be an earring. Uh, this is why we tell women and men not to wear jewelry when they're prepare, you know, preparing food to serve. It can be other things like broken glass. Um, people use those can openers to open a can and sometimes little mill shavings can get into food. That would be a physical contaminant. Uh, bandages, which we hope we don't ever see that in our food, but sometimes it happens. You get the occasional hair or when you eat at a restaurant, that would be a physical contaminant. Again, not always um, terribly dangerous depending on what it is, although it could be. I had a friend of a friend of a friend who actually did consume a product that had ground glass in it, and it was very, um, ended up with the bloody gums from, from trying to chew it. So that was a very dangerous situation. Not to mention, probably a lawsuit. Chemical hazards, this is when we would get a chemical product into food that's obviously not supposed to be there. It could be as simple as you just sanitized your hands and then you touched a food item and you may be contaminated with a chemical product. Um, if you have, this is why I'm going to tell you many times to make sure you label your chemicals in their bottles and containers so you don't accidentally mix something up with food product. Another way that I talked about food becoming unsafe was time and temperature of use. And what this means is when you've let food stay too long at temperatures that are going to let pathogens and bacteria grow. So this would be an example of leaving your ground beef over here, maybe not in the refrigerator. It's sitting out at temperatures that are not keeping it cold, and in return, you're actually having bacteria grow on the product. And the thing about pathogens like E. coli and this other bacteria is that it grows exponentially, and it grows very quickly. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, so you have no way of knowing it's there. So we talk about foods that might require time and temperature control in order to stay safe. So these are the types of foods that have a higher risk of pathogen growth when they are subjected to this time and temperature abuse. And I'm going to actually let you guys type into the chat box, what do you think are some foods that would require time and temperature control in order to be safe? So I'll give you a second and Jen can read these to me of just, just what do you think are some foods that you might really need to be careful about? Meats, yep, good one. Dairy, Dairy yep. Eggs, yep. Chicken, yep. Okay. I'm typing on until. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fish, yep. So we've covered them. I think everyone was right on the nose here. So, yes, dairy, eggs, meats, beef, chicken, of course, and then fish and shellfish. Um, there are other foods that might fall in this category, but these are our, large, our largest group of foods, mainly your meats, fish, and dairy, that require time and temperature control, meaning simply get them in the fridge or the freezer. 
do not let them sit out at what I call room temperature or which is this temperature danger zone that we're gonna talk about later. Okay, great job. All right, so other ways that food can become unsafe uh, in addition to the hazards uh, and to time temperature abuse uh, is cross-contamination. So this phrase talks about transferring pathogens from one surface or food to another. So in the picture, here's a common example, and I'll talk about this more too, is you can see we have some lettuce probably in a cooler where it looks like uh, juice from a meat product has dribbled down onto it. So if we have that raw beef, for instance, say above a rack of lettuce and the meat starts to thaw or it's got a bit of a puncture in its wrapping and it gets the meat juice, raw meat juice onto another product, you've just contaminated that other product. Another a good example of this is when people use a cutting board and they're cutting one of those foods that are potentially unsafe, like maybe you're filleting a raw fish or something like that. And then you use the same cutting board to cut maybe vegetables. If you don't either use a new cutting board or completely clean and sanitize that cutting board, you may have just cross-contaminated by um, making then the vegetable product unsafe. Okay, poor cleaning and sanitation is another concern. Uh, again, you might have some piece of equipment or a table that you haven't cleaned properly and kind of like the situation with the cutting board, you have the potential to spread something to an item, especially an item that's not getting cooked later. Now here we've got you know, a bag of cereal, for example. Anything that's ready to eat that's not getting processed further and you contaminate it, there's no chance to um, eliminate that contamination. And last one, last but not least, because this is actually the most important, poor personal hygiene. So actually poor hygiene is the number one cause of foodborne illness outbreaks. So, I mean, there are certainly things that we can't control with the food system, but people basically not washing their hands is a pretty high reason that a lot of these illnesses occur. So remember that little tidbit for when you take your quizzes, poor personal hygiene, number one. So this occurs when people transfer pathogens from their body to food in some way. It could be sneezing, coughing on the food, they could have a wound or an open sore or cut on their hands, maybe they've been in contact with an ill person and then they came to work, they don't wash their hands, we're going to talk about hand washing a lot even though it's very basic, it's very important. Um, so these are all different ways that a person can transmit something on the food that then someone else consumes. So personal cleanliness is important. And I always say people, and I've worked in food service, if you ever have to have an uncomfortable conversation with somebody about how they need to uh, be a bit cleaner when they come to work, it's very awkward, but it's also very important. Also, don't eat, don't smoke, don't chew gum in the food prep area. Uh, and even for pantry personnel, you know, your food is, is in containers and things like that, but these are still good um, habits to have, such as washing the hands and not eating around the food. Okay, again, hand washing, extremely important, critical for contaminating food. And according to Surf Safe, you should spend about 20 seconds total washing your hands and you should follow certain steps. Now we probably are all washing our hands way more than we ever used to, I know I am, uh, but let's go through what the, uh, these defined steps for hand washing are. And again, they should be pretty obvious, but just so we know, step one, put water on your hands and arms, running water that's hot, not cold, but not so hot that you're scalding yourself. Step two, obviously use soap and build a lather. Step three, scrub your hands and arms. So I actually tell you you should wash up your arms the way a surgeon should. Uh, and you should do this for 10 to 15 seconds. So remember that number as well. Uh, 10 to 15 seconds is the total amount of time you should spend going through the soap and rubbing your hands together. Uh, that might be something that we're not all doing was we do a real quick wash and rinse, but really it's a bit more time than that. And you should also clean under fingernails between fingers you should rinse under running warm water, and then you should dry your hands. Now, they made a little note here, and obviously if you cannot, you know, wipe your hands off on your sweater or your apron is handy. If you cannot use a single paper towel, or I'm sorry, do use a, a single use paper towel that you can throw away or a blower if you have it. And I always, when I do this class in person, I like to gauge the, um, <laughs> I like to gauge what generation my audience is from, because I always say, who remembers those icky white hand towels that you used to see in public restrooms that you had to pull down, those would not be an ideal situation. Do you know what I'm talking about, Jen? <laughs> You're a little younger than me. Yes, the ones that you have to keep pulling down. Yes, not, not ideal. 
Um, you should wash hands after you use the restroom. If you've touched your body, your clothing, obviously if you cough, sneeze, or blow your nose. If you've had something to eat, drink, gone out for a smoke break, handle any kind of dirty items like dirty linens or taken out the garbage, these are all times to wash your hands. Hand sanitizer. Now again, we're talking kind of outside of coronavirus right now, because again, I know I'm sanitizing like crazy. I'm sure most people are if you can. Now in a normal situation, we would say if you're going to use hand sanitizer, do not use it in place of hand washing. Use it after washing your hands. And this is because hand sanitizer itself really does not get dirt off. It, it kills the bacteria, but any dirt you have on your hands or again under your fingernails, things like that, the sanitizer is not as effective for getting that if you haven't washed first. So we want to ideally hand wash first, then use sanitizer, and then wait for the sanitizer to dry before you touch something, especially before you touch food. Gloves are also an option. We do have gloves that we try to make available here that should be worn when you're directly handling food. You should always wear gloves. Gloves should be changed when they become dirty, if they rip, if you're moving on to a different task, you've been doing one thing and you want to move on to something else, get a clean pair of gloves. Um, if you've taken your phone out of your pocket and checked your calls, really you should change your gloves uh, and then start with a fresh pair. So a couple other unhygienic behaviors that I've already mentioned about the smoking, drinking, having a snack, having some gum. You should not do these in any food handling area or any food storage area or anywhere really that food is being served. Only do these in designated areas away from the food. Okay, I'm going to do a quick note on food allergies. Um, this is not the same as a foodborne illness, but can be equally as serious so I wanted to make a note of this. Um, if you work in a pantry or do a food prep, it's good to understand what allergens are, uh, how to avoid them, where to look for them on a label uh, in case you need to help clients who have concerns about it. And the reason, again, also very important is because the people with allergies can sometimes have very serious reactions when they consume an allergen. So we wanna make sure if someone does come in and say, you know, I do need assistance, but I have this uh, peanut allergy um, that we can help them. Uh, and make sure we can find where on the label it says where those allergies are located or for preparing food that we know what kind of foods to avoid. So on a packaged product, we can find it on the label, uh, generally in the ingredients and then always under the ingredients, um, it's gonna say this product contains. Um, now that contains statement doesn't include every allergen in existence. Sometimes people have allergies to things that are a little less common like mustard or sesame seeds. Those are not in the contained statement. The contained statement only covers what we call the big eight or the top eight food allergens. So I'm gonna kind of throw this back out to the audience, make sure everyone's using their, uh, got their thinking caps on here a little bit. What do you think, if you had to guess, what are some of the top eight food allergens? What do you think they might be? There's a couple well-known ones and then a couple that maybe aren't so well-known. Wheat, yep. What was the second one? Oh, peanut butter, yes, mm -hmm. obviously, yeah, absolutely. Gluten is actually not an allergen. Gluten intolerance is a slightly different thing. Yep, soy, nuts, tree nuts, mm hmm Milk, milk shelf, I think you guys covered them all, great. Yes, so dairy, milk, cheese, any dairy product can be an allergen, eggs, soy. Uh, if you've ever had, know anyone with a soy allergy, that's a tough one too, because soy is in a lot of things. Fish and sh uh, fish is on here, tree nuts and peanuts. Those are, peanut tends to be the more serious one, although not to say that any, any of these could be very serious, but peanut tends to be the one that causes that anaphylactic shock, which is when people actually can't breathe. So that one can be very scary. Shellfish is actually listed separate from fish, but they're both an allergen. And then it's the wheat in bread that causes an allergy. Like I said, gluten's a little bit different. Gluten is an intolerance. Uh, it's a different um, part of the wheat protein that causes that. Uh, but it, if someone says they're gluten intolerant or wheat allergy, you can kind of treat it the same way in terms of where to find the information um, on what, what foods they might not want to be able to take with them. All right, so if you were helping someone, maybe find products that are appropriate, you can help them look at the label and say um, that the contained statement down here will say of those big eight, what are in a product. And a lot of products are kind of gone even extra cautious and they'll say may contain another ingredient or they'll say uh, processed on equipment that also 
processes treat us, for instance. So depending on the severity of an allergy, someone might want to avoid anything that says it even may have come in contact. Just a bit on food allergies there. Okay, so when it comes to receiving food into your organization, food that you have either ordered from us, from somewhere else, or that has been donated, you still wanna follow procedures to make sure it stays safe in all um, elements of the receiving, storage, and distribution process. Uh, one thing we wanna be careful to do is control time and temperature during receiving of foods that require time and temperature control. And there's a temperature range that we always wanna be aware of, and I'll say it enough times that you hopefully you'll never forget it, um, it's 41 to 135 degrees. It's the range of temperatures in between this that is called the temperature danger zone. We well, call it the danger zone because these are the temperature range at which pathogens can grow well on food and potentially cause a foodborne illness. So again, uh, think about your meats and your dairy and things that need to go in the fridge right away. Something that's in this danger zone range and the middle of it, I like to call, you know, maybe think about room temperature a little bit warmer is when things are really an issue. That's a temperature that bacteria likes. So we wanna make sure we keep food out of that range. So we wanna control time and temperature during receiving. So again, from pickup, from the donor, from us, all the way to handoff to the client, from the time it spends in our warehouse, on our truck, we all wanna make sure we're controlling time and temperature during these processes. So we'll come back to that a bit more later. In addition to time and temperature, you also can inspect food during receiving to make sure it is safe based on whether it looks like it has been um, subject to pest infestation, if it's not looking appropriate for something that you wanna take. So you can inspect food at receiving for appearance as well as for temperature. And the temperature that refrigerated food should be received at should be 41 degrees or lower. Don't worry about this Celsius, I just can't delete it from the slide. <laughs> Frozen food, recommend that it comes at zero degrees or lower. Um, produce that has been cut should also be refrigerated to 41 or lower, but whole produce, so your bag of apples, this actually does not need to be held refrigerated. It can be received as well as stored for a time at what we call dry storage temperatures. Um, so not necessarily chilled, although we all know it'll last longer if it's in the, the cooler. Uh, another thing when receiving food is to look at the source and decide if these are products that we want to accept into our organization. Um, you know, people often donate with the best of intentions, but these are not always things that are appropriate to, for us to distribute. For instance, homemade products, those nice um, homemade jams and jellies that somebody makes that are probably wonderful, but so we cannot accept because it did come from a licensed uh, kitchen and usually don't have a label, so it would not be appropriate to accept. Uh, any meat, uh, we get the hunting season, things that, you know, venison and things like that have to be from a USDA certified processing plant. We cannot just take anything. I'm going to talk more about evaluating food later on. So uh, storing food safely. So you've received food, you've inspected your deliveries at receiving, make sure they come at their correct temperatures if needed. And the next step is to move it into storage. So we have some cold storage guidelines, which just like receiving, and again, you'll never forget this temperature, refrigerated food should be 41 or lower. Frozen food should come frozen solid and then be stored at zero degrees or lower. Uh, your temperature logs should be maintained for all cold storage units and, and updated regularly, daily if able, if, or as much as you are in there to make sure that they are maintaining these temperatures. When you're storing food, you should store it only in designated food storage areas, which seems like it doesn't need to be said, but occasionally it does. Uh, sometimes people get creative with their space and that's great, but make sure your food storage areas are for food only. And also don't store food directly on the floor as in this picture here. You wanna store food at least six inches off the floor. So on a pallet, on some kind of riser to keep it up off the floor so that you're able to clean underneath the shelving. And also that will help reduce um, pests getting under there, uh, dampness, things like that. So always store your boxes of food up off the floor six inches. When it comes to storing food, you should also store food away from the wall. Uh, guideline is usually two inches or about two or three inches away from the wall. If you're in a cold storage situation, this will help for air circulation. Um, it'll also help uh, we, um, it drips or leaks or things like that to prevent the boxes from getting damaged. 
When you're storing food, uh, you should store ready to eat food above any kind of meats or raw meats. They should not be on the same pallet or shelf. They can go in the same refrigerator or freezer, but you should always have the ready to eat products like cheese or um, vegetables or fruits or things that are not getting processed further should always go above any kind of raw meat. So this is a storage or, or in your refrigerator where you'd have your prepared foods and your fruits and veggies on top. If you had multiple different types of the potentially, um, you know, the time and temperature sensitive foods, there's actually a certain order they go in. And this order is based on what temperature they ultimately get cooked into, which for this portion of the training, you don't need to know. But then you could put your fish and seafood next, your beef and pork after that, ground meats below that, and poultry on the bottom. Poultry requires the highest cooking temperature, uh, which is why it's on the bottom. Because if it was, say, above the fish, and perhaps your temperatures got a little off and your poultry started to thaw a teeny bit or dripple down some juices, you're not cooking fish to the same temperature that you're cooking the chicken. Uh, so the highest, one that requires the highest cooking temperature goes on the bottom. And this picture you've seen, it's on your um, food safety handouts that we often provide. When you're storing food, it's a good idea to label food for storage. A good practice is to write the expiration date on the outside of a box so you can easily see what's going to expire sooner and rotate those products accordingly based on those dates. And when you are looking at dates, we have a couple different types of dates that appear on products. We have a sell-by date, usually shows up on dairy. Uh, and this is a quality date. This is not a safety date. This tells the store how long to display the product for sale when it says sell-by. That's actually for the store's knowledge. Um, the product is still, stay, still safe to eat past this date. Now, if it's something like milk, there's not a huge amount of leeway, but there is a certain amount of time, about a week, that it can still be consumed safely after that date. A use by or expiration date. Again, this is not a safety date. This is a, the last date recommended for peak quality. Product is still safe to eat past this date. Uh, the best buy, same thing, another quality date. Again, it tells you when the best day to eat it for quality is, but safety will still be um, okay after that date for a time. This date here, this is a packing or manufacturing code. So you might see cans when you're going through and you're checking the dates that they have numbers and symbols that you don't really understand. Those are often just manufacturer codes that are used for tracking purposes or recalls and not an expiration date. Now, there should be another date on here somewhere that does give the expiration date. And if you cannot find that, you might want to consider either discarding the product or you can always call me um, if you're seeing some codes that you can't uh, decipher. And or sometimes people send me a picture and try, you know, what does this mean? And we can figure out what the actual date is. Now, the exception to all of this is infant formula and baby food. These are products that we do not want to buy, use, or distribute after it's used by date. So that is a hard and fast rule because this use by date ensures that the formula contains the full quantity of each nutrient that's described on the label. And when it comes to something like formula, especially, or that's the main source of nutrition that an infant is receiving, you want to make sure it has that maximum amount of nutrients. So we do not want to use these past their expiration date. And they should be discarded. So if you ever have a question about how long something can keep for, uh, you all should have a copy of the Food Keeper brochure. You might have a printout version as opposed to the actual brochure. If you need a copy, you can always call me or email me and I'll give you one. Uh, this is actually also online, although I'm finding the online site's not quite as user friendly as I'd love it to be, uh, but here's a link to the Food Keeper online that lets you search by an item. And you can type a name in and it'll tell you uh, some more information about storage properly and how long it can be used for. Okay, as far as refrigerated and frozen food, um, the shelf life of, I should actually say frozen food, sorry, not up refrigerated here. Freezing will keep something safe for, I mean, realistically an indefinite amount of time. However, the quality will suffer if something's in the freezer too long. So we, we might say that something can be frozen essentially forever, but if you've ever dug something out of the back of your freezer and decided, oh, I'm going to thaw this and see how it is. Sometimes the taste isn't always as good. So we still want to use those um, and not let them sit too long. When it comes to recalled food products, uh, we do monitor recall notices from the FDA, the USDA, 
these do get posted on the website for your ordering. Um, I post uh, recalls that are things that have not come from us, but are just out there in the world that you might see in a donation to be aware of. Uh, we do have a recall procedure in place that can be activated if needed. And we also conduct what we call mock recalls periodically, just to make sure that if we had to communicate with somebody about a recall, that people are getting our emails, getting our phone calls and responding. Okay, storing for your dry goods. Uh, again, we recommend the FIFO, first expired, first out method of storing dried goods. This way, if it's got a use by date or expiration date that's coming up sooner, you can rotate the items on your shelves. And again, if you've got things labeled, it's a little bit easier to find it. And make sure those things that are gonna expire first are in front and can get distributed sooner. Okay, I'm gonna pause now. Does anybody have any questions that they wanna type in? I don't know how to unmute everybody right now, but if you have a question, um, raise your hand or type it into the box at this point. Otherwise, I will keep on going. And you can type questions in at any time and I will take a pause. Okay, well, I'm gonna keep going, but yeah, feel free to wave your hand or uh, type something in if you do have a question. Uh, gonna continue on with evaluating foods and deciding if you should be distributing them or not. Now, most things are okay, but we have a, quite a few things that might not be okay. And for safety reasons, we wanna make sure we look at our items before has, passing them out. So cans, uh, especially cans. If cans have a minor dent, not an issue. If there's a severe dent, especially if it's in the seam of the can, this might be a food product you want to discard and not give out. Uh, especially if it's got very deep dents, if it's so crushed that it can't even stack, this could be dangerous. Um, crushed cans can be subjected to, um, I believe it's botulism is the bacteria that can grow in cans uh, if they're not handled properly. So we really want to check them over, um, and look for very crushed or bulging ends. If it's missing a label, we also cannot use it because we'll have no idea of knowing what's in it or what the expiration date is. Uh, if it's very rusty, we do not want to distribute those. Here's an example of that swollen or bulging end on a can. Those need to be discarded. Uh, if it's got a puncture where um, oxygen may have been able to get into a can, we also want to discard those. Those could also have um, a bacterial contamination. If you see signs that it's leaking, now you sometimes you pick something up that's a little bit sticky on the outside, now that could have come from something else. But if you're concerned it may have come from inside that can, that means that there is a, a puncture or an opening. We do not want to give those out. Uh, same thing with uh, something like a jelly jar with a metal lid. If that is swollen, rusted, or badly dented, discard those. Um, any kind of product that's got like a safety seal or a lid that screws on where you can kind of tell that the button has popped or the safety ring has broken, those would not be appropriate. Here's another unlabeled item, uh, missing label and unreadable label. If you absolutely cannot find an expiration date on it uh, for some reason, those we would not want to distribute. Oh. Oh. So many slides are not progressing and I don't know how to fix that. Is anybody else having that issue? Yes. Okay. Right now I've got a picture of a messy looking jar of spaghetti sauce that says discard jars and bottles. Is everyone seeing that? Yes, okay. Sorry, Jen's reading a question to I'm me. Try, and I'm trying to read it. <laughs> That's why I'm pausing here and staring off into space. <laughs> Sorry. Um, cans or drinks that mm -hmm. I'm not sure what kind of carton. Somebody's asking about cans or drinks that come in a carton with plastic. 
we may have to discuss this separately because I'm not sure what you're referring to. So I would need a little more information. So uh, Jen's monitoring questions. Whoever asked that, I can. Yeah, we can get back to that. Uh, so jars that have visible signs of leakage might mean that lid is broken or damaged. Uh, here's a product where the food is discolored. Uh, we certainly don't want to use that. Anything that where the food looks unusual in appearance or it's very badly separated, if it's something that's not supposed to separate, some things separate a little bit naturally, uh, but it's something that doesn't normally do that, would be worth discarding. Uh, packaged dry food, you still also would want to check. Uh, some dry food is in a single package, others is double packaged, meaning there's like a bag inside of a box. Like for instance, cereal has got the plastic bag that's inside the box. If the outer box maybe is a bit torn, but you can see that the inner packaging is okay, that's fine. But if it's a single layer and there's damage, that would be something else you'd want to um, not give out. Oh, okay. So I think, okay, so I know Ensure sometimes comes wrapped tightly in plastic. You could, you could remove that, provided that each individual item has the right information. So, and in the case of like an Ensure or a drink box of some sort, every bottle should have the nutrition facts, the expiration date, the allergens. If something doesn't though, for some reason, you'd want to keep it in any kind of outer packaging. Hopefully that answers that question. Mm, all right, here's an unlabeled item, again, for a dry good, like a pancake mix or something. Just wanna make sure it has labels and code dates. This here is a product that looks like maybe got nibbled on a little bit by something. I mean, it could just be damaged from wear and tear, but if something appears that it has been chewed on, could be a sign of pest infestation. So we'd certainly want to get rid of that and investigate more and make sure you don't have um, other signs of pests, which we'll talk about a bit more later on. Here's one where uh, it's the double packaging, but obviously there's loose pasta. That means the inner packaging is open somewhere. So that would be something not to use. Anything that's wet or stained also should be discarded. It's another ripped package. So again, these are kind of Kind of obvious, hopefully. Uh, here's a uh, mold on fruit. Uh, you'd want to discard anything that's got mold, signs of decay, uh, abnormal odors, uh, produce that's coming in packaging that's not intended for food. Uh, signs of insects, uh, you know, this would be like live or dead or signs of eggs, things like that would be something to be not giving out. Okay, same thing with pouches. We have things like beef stew that come in this type of pouch. Any kind of leak, hole, puncture, I think that's supposed to say crust, sorry about the typo there, cracks, mold, seals that are um, coming undone, bulges, you know, again, discard those products. Okay, so that was evaluating food that comes in. Um, you should always, as you're stocking your shelves or packing bags, just take a look at things and just make sure that the food is, is looking um, in an approved state. Uh, as far as repacking food, now food pantries are not approved to prepare, repack, or serve meals on site. Um, so you do not want to break apart items and repack them. And the exception to this would simply be whole uncut produce. Okay. I'll pause again because I'm kind of going to a whole new topic. Any other questions on evaluating food? Um, okay. I think someone's, some questions coming up. Okay. I think Jen's just going to respond via, via uh, another chat. Okay, so last topic for pantries here is cleaning, sanitizing, and pest control. How am I doing on time, by the way, just real quick? Oh, okay. I don't want to go over my two hours, but I don't think I'm going to. Okay, so cleaning and sanitizing, very important in any situation, but again, as we are in a new world here, uh, even more important to be vigilant about our cleaning and our sanitizing of our, not only our food contact surfaces, but other surfaces in our organization and anywhere we're gonna have people coming in. So cleaning versus sanitizing, what's the difference? Well, cleaning simply gets the food and dirt off of a surface. Sanitizing is this extra step of reducing pathogens on a surface to a safe level. So we usually need a sanitizing solution um, your bleach water, for instance, is perfectly appropriate for sanitizing something. 
Uh, if you need information on how to mix up a bleach water, um, there is a document on the CDC that tells you how to do that. And I have that information as well. You could always ask me uh, what those correct um, ratios of bleached water is. You don't want it too strong, but you also don't want it too weak. As well as, again, obviously products that you can purchase that are meant to sanitize. So all surfaces should be cleaned, rinsed, and sanitized. And again, not just things that touch food. Now this is again more for, well, this is for anybody, both food prep sites as well as pantries, to periodically be cleaning your walls, your floors, um, um, definitely your storage shelves, and garbage containers, both inside and out, should be cleaned periodically. So how do we do it? Kind of like hand washing, we have some specific steps that are outlined to be most effective. So if you've got a tabletop, for instance, that you want to wipe down and sanitize, the steps that you would take to do this properly would be, first of all, to get rid of any visible on the surface, scrape or, or wipe off that. Then you wash it with your water and just some soapy water. You should rinse that after you've washed it. Then you would sanitize the surface using your appropriate sanitizing solution. And then you want to let it air dry. Um, this is important because just like we don't want to use the icky used towel to wipe our clean hands, or we also don't want to use a potentially unclean towel that's just going to put pathogens right back onto a surface. When to clean and sanitize. Now, this would be, again, these are kind of pre-COVID guidelines. Um, so things might be a little bit different now. You might be sanitizing tables anytime anybody comes in or anytime anything happens. So if you're doing that, that's fine. Uh, but just for our general knowledge in, again, a different time period, the, the rule is after four hours of continuous use, for instance, like a table or a counter surface that's being used for something, if you're using, say, a cutting board and you're switching from raw to ready-to-eat food, that's when you'd want to clean and sanitize that surface and that cutting board, and really any time that it's needed. Okay, in addition to cleaning, this is a good place to talk about pest control. Uh, and maintaining a pest-free operation. Um, we do even have um, the operation support grant, I believe does even include um, an application process for funds to help with pest control if needed. Uh, so the first thing you wanna do is look for signs of pests. Um, this could be the presence of bugs, either alive or dead. Uh, feces that you might see, usually you see the mouse feces before you see the actual mouse in most situations. That's how you know you've got them. Uh, you might see signs of nests. This is why it's a good idea to be periodically going underneath those raised shelves and getting a broom under there and making sure nothing's building a home under there. And also another good reason to inspect your packaging and make sure you don't see signs that something has been chewed on. You don't see signs of the pantry moths or any other kind of infestation. So when it comes to pest control, we kind of have three lines of defense. And the first is really just try not to let them inside in the first place. Now, this would be having maybe keeping your outside doors shut, windows screened or closed. If you've got a, an older building that maybe has some gaps and cracks around the doors and windows and pipes, you can do your best to uh, take care of those so we don't let things inside. Your second line of defense then, in case maybe you can't control them coming in, is don't make the place too comfortable for them. Uh, they're going to need food, water, and shelter to set up house. So if you are not having food that's available easily to them, if you're not leaving water sitting on the floor, if you're cleaning up papers and things like that that are used for nests, if you're taking out your trash and you're recycling regularly, you're making a hospitable environment. And third would be, throw oh, actually not third, sorry, another note would be to throw out food that has any signs of pests, just go ahead and toss it. And then your third line of defense, if you do have the pests and you haven't been able to keep them out or keep them from settling in, your best defense is then to call a professional. We call it a pest control operator uh, because sometimes it involves chemicals um, and more time than you're going to be able to do on your own. Okay, now any other questions or anything you want to share? Um, that you're doing regarding food safety or any topics you want to discuss, uh, just go ahead and throw those in the chat. And I'll give you a moment while I take a drink of water here.
Okay. If there aren't, no, okay. I'll, then, I'll explain. Uh, you don't have to. You could, if you want to, simply just protect your own hands from getting dry. If you're using the bleach water, I kind of like to wear gloves because I can't stand the smell on my skin. And, you know, it does get a bit drying. Um, so it, it's not required, but it's not a bad idea. Okay, so as I was saying in the beginning, but I'll, again, I'll repeat it because I know some people may have missed it. Um, for a pantry staff or volunteer, what we covered is what you need to know for your um, organization. So there is a quiz then that just covers the material that we've already talked about. It's 25 multiple choice questions and you would need to get an 80% correct in order to pass. And once you pass the quiz, then I'm gonna email you a certificate that covers you for the three years. So that would be for a pantry. Now, if you're uh, somebody who does any kind of on-site food preparation, like a soup kitchen, a shelter, a snack program, and you're on this training, what you're gonna wanna do is actually stay on the Zoom call, and I'm gonna continue on with things that are more related to cooking uh, and preparing food. And then you're gonna get actually a different quiz at the end that's gonna cover all the material that we've talked about thus far, plus it's gonna discuss or ask questions about the material that I'm gonna continue on with. So Jen is gonna put the link in, um, so there's two in that email. Yeah, so Jen right now is putting the link, so it's an online quiz. If you have any trouble accessing it or you'd rather just do a paper quiz, we can certainly talk about that later. But if you've been wanting to just take the online quiz, Jen's putting the link to that in right now. You can just go ahead and do it. Make sure you put your name, you can type your name into a box and your agency name so I know who, who did it and then you simply click on your correct answers. It's multiple choice. So hopefully that will all work correctly. Okay, so that's the quiz for pantries. Now, like I said, if you're a pantry and you'd like to stay on and, and learn about cooking food to the proper temperature, that's absolutely fine. Um, you're just, you don't need to, in terms of being a pantry program, this is just sort of optional. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. If that doesn't make sense to anybody, feel free to up in a question. And I'm going to make a note, uh, maybe people are typing or deciding what they want to do. If you are something, somebody that's preparing meals, no, their other option for food safety is Serve Safe. As I mentioned, this is the nationally recognized five-year certificate. If you are, I, I recommend Serve Safe if you are somebody who is overseeing all the food safety. If you're a larger organization, you are in a position where you are overseeing operations and are heavily involved in the food prep and the food safety, Serve Safe might be a better option because it's much more in-depth and intensive. And we do provide Serve Safe training. Um, if you've got cooks or volunteers who help out with the meal prep, then doing this basic training is totally appropriate. A few questions. Somebody, so somebody raised a hand. Okay, so how do I unmute everybody? <laughs> I'm gonna, I was gonna unmute just so I could give everybody a chance to. Can we go to participants? I can. And then can you point, uh, click on that and see what comes up. And then you can um, oh. mute all or unmute all. So. Mute all. Okay. So then maybe you can unmute them all. Oh. Mute, mute. Oh. All right, all right. I'm going to unmute people, I think. So if anybody has a question, unmute. All right. I think most people are unmuted. If anybody has a question, feel free to say it. Okay, not hearing anything. So I'm going to go ahead and mute again, so you'll be again muted. Okay, uh, Jen just left the room, so if you are typing questions, it might re require her coming back before I see them. What I'm going to do is continue on then. Uh, and continue on with uh, items that are specific to those who prepare food. 
So we're gonna talk about safe food preparation. Topics we're gonna to cover here are how to properly thaw food, uh, preparing and cooking food, serving it safely, and then cooling down leftovers and reheating food. So a lot of temperatures involved here. Okay, when it comes to thawing food, so you should never thaw food at room temperature. And then again, when I do this live, I always ask for a show of hands of who's ever thawed something on the counter. And again, I've been guilty of this in the past myself. Now that's not an appropriate way to thaw food because we're putting it into that danger zone when we're leaving it on the counter in our probably you know, somewhat warm kitchen, we're putting it into the danger zone where pathogens can begin to grow. So there are four different ways you can safely thaw foods, and I'm sorry, this abbreviation here is from SurfSafe. TCS foods just means those foods that are um, likely to pose more of a hazard, such as your chicken, beef, fish, um, and meats. So four different ways to safely thaw those types of foods. One is just by putting it into the refrigerator where it's gonna stay at a temperature of 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Uh, a second method is to submerge it under running water. Now this should be potable water, drinking water, at a temperature of 70 degrees or lower. So we don't wanna use hot water. And I have a story I like to tell where I, uh, been telling my boyfriend, don't thaw stuff on the counter because he was doing that for a while. I said, put it in the sink under running water. So I come into the kitchen a few minutes later and there's steam billowing out of the sink. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, you said to put it under running water, but he was using hot, hot water. And I said, well, you're actually like basically poaching the product here. And that's not what you wanna do. You want that water to be a little bit cooler, not hot water. And it also should be water that drains. We're not trying to fill up the sink and submerge the item in the water. We want it to run over the product and then go down the drain. You should also use a sink that's clean and sanitized and okay to put food into. So don't be using your dishwashing sink or your mop bucket sink for like that kind of thing. A third method for safely thawing food is to do it in the microwave. Uh, however, if you are going to do this, you need to cook the food immediately when it comes out of the microwave and not put it in the fridge or put it away somewhere. Cook it right away. And the fourth method is to thaw it as part of the cooking process. So if you pull something out of the freezer and you don't want to spend the time to let it thaw, uh, depending on how you're cooking the item, you can go ahead and put it in the oven from frozen. Sometimes this affects the quality a little bit and the taste, but it is an effective thawing method. What are you eating? That looks good. <laughs> She's got, Jen's got a delicious looking snack over here. Uh, preparing food. Now we want to avoid cross-contamination during this preparation process. As we mentioned, cross-contamination can spread bacteria if you're improperly handling, especially your raw meats, poultry, seafood, even eggs. Um, you're creating an environment um, where there's potential for cross-contamination. So we just want to make sure we're doing um, methods to avoid that, such as separating our raw meats, poultry, seafood, and eggs from other foods. Uh, as I mentioned, if you are using a cutting board for items, um, you wanna make sure you're using different cutting boards. Uh, I've seen people who even use different colored cutting boards so that they know which one is usually used for produce and which one might be used for meats. Uh, you don't wanna place any kind of cooked food, like a ready to eat food on a plate or a tray or anything like that that may have previously held a raw meat item. So we wanna make sure we're just careful about preventing that cross contamination. When it comes to cooking food, here's where we get into some temperatures. So cooking food to the correct minimum internal temperature is really the only way to reduce pathogens to what we would call a safe level. Uh, and also a note here, I don't think I have this in my, oh, I do have it in my slide. So cooking food will destroy pathogens, E. coli, salmonella, shigella, there's a whole bunch that we talk about in SurfSafe. However, and people do ask me this, uh, cooking does not destroy allergens in a food product. So just to be aware of that. In addition, those viruses that I mentioned, like the hepatitis, um, the norovirus, those are not destroyed by cooking either. Um, toxins I haven't really mentioned, but there are some uh, types of bacteria and fungi that produce toxins, <clears throat> and those are also not destroyed by cooking. So really for those types of foods, we just wanna make sure we're handling everything correctly during all phases of preparation, since cooking is not necessarily a, a cure-all for everything. It does, however, effectively destroy bacteria and pathogens. 
So I'm not going to ask you to memorize this chart for your quiz. Um, I mean, you can also have, we have magnets that have this information, or you can always print out something for your own use if you want to know the temperatures for everything. Uh, but just so we understand that there are different cooking requirements for the type of food. And as I had mentioned earlier, poultry, uh, including chicken, turkey, duck, these have a higher cooking temperature in order to kill the pathogens than some other foods. Uh, so for chicken, you always want to make sure you're temping it to 165 degrees and it is maintaining that temperature of 165 for 15 seconds. So that's what that means when we say cooking requirements. So this will be taking your probe thermometer, which I'm going to talk about in a minute here, inserting it into your chicken breast or your turkey or whatever and making sure it's reaching that temperature and also holding that temperature for a few seconds there, for 15 seconds. Uh, this includes stuffing that's made with meat or stuffed meats. Uh, the next category is ground beef, ground pork, ground seafood. Uh, now, again, you don't have to have all these memorized. Uh, injected meats, maybe like a brined ham. Those only have to come to 155 in order to decrease the pathogen level. Seafood and steaks and eggs, all these can come to 145 to be safe to eat. Uh, and then your roasts, a roast pork, roast beef, roast lamb, also 145. So good information to have, honestly, good information to have for your home cooking as well. But obviously when we're serving people, we want to make sure we're doing everything as safely as possible. So if you want to hand out with those temperatures at any point, just let me know. And again, going back to our storage temperature. So as I had mentioned earlier, the storage temperature is based on the cooking temperatures of food. And that's why the poultry again is on the bottom. You know, the ground meats come up here, the fish that need a little bit of less temperature. Um, that is, just describes it, the rationale for how this is organized this way. If you want to cook food in the microwave, this is actually fine. However, you want to cook these foods to an internal temperature of 165 degrees. So this is your meat, poultry, seafood, eggs in the microwave. And a couple of microwaving notes. Again, probably already know this if you ever cook my, anything at home via the microwave. And I'm going to pause here because Jen's got a question for me to read. Yes. Question, why, where does dairy go? Oh, where does dairy go? Dairy would be on the top with the prepared, well, probably on the same level as the fruits and veggies. Really, these top two can just be combined into anything we would call a ready to eat food. So, dairy, cheese, yogurts, fruits and veggies, anything that's just ready to eat out of the package, those all would go on the top. Okay. Any other questions? Can I get to ask you a follow-up question? Yes, about that? yes, we have a follow-up. Can you talk about how food is stored on the door? Oh, that can good idea. So Jen has a great point about talking about food that's stored on the door of the refrigerator. And I know I've actually mentioned this once or twice on site visits that I've done with people, uh, of just being cautious about what you put on the door, because that's the obviously the part that's going to have the most um, variable temperature as you're opening and closing the fridge. So things that are not in these categories here of higher risk foods, these foods should go internally into your fridge and freezer. The door can be reserved for things that um, have less potential for a safety hazard, such as your condiments, um, you know, ketchups, dressings, um, I don't know, things, things, that have, things that require less time, things that are less at risk for time and temperature abuse. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, good point. Another question? Oh, drinks, I mean, again, above the meats. If nothing else, just keep thinking about having the meats go on the bottom. Okay, microwave cooking, a few notes. If you're gonna cook food in the microwave, make sure it's covered. Stir it halfway through, because you know that it tends to heat unevenly. Let food stand for a few minutes after you take it out of the microwave. And then when you do take that temperature, do it in more than one spot. Okay, so when it comes to taking temperatures, uh, a nice easy tool to use is what we call a bimetallic stem thermometer, uh, sometimes called a probe thermometer. Um, you probably all have these if you do make, you know, prepare food or some version of it. If you ever need thermometers, let me know. I have them available that I can um, provide to agencies. Um, what you want to do is insert this food thermometer. It's got a, a small dimple, um, not quite halfway up the stem. You want to make sure that's where the sensor is. So you want to make sure that's getting all the way into the food. So when you are attempting foods, to check that internal temperature, make sure you're actually getting it all the way inside 
the food product and as far up as that dimple. Uh, you want the probe to be the correct size. So if you're doing very thin pieces of fish, for instance, and that thermometer is just very large and can't go all the way, you know, it's just going to go right through it, that might not be the most ideal thermometer. You want to find the thickest part of the item. So sometimes you have to go in sideways. So in this picture here, they're going straight up and down into the item, but a better um, alternative might do more like this picture where you're going in from the side so you can get it in further. Oh, and then, sorry, going back, again, two readings in two different locations is always ideal, just to make sure that internal temperature is correct. Uh, sometimes those thermometers need calibrating. They're not, I mean, if you've got one of the cheaper ones, you know, they're fine, they work, but if you drop it or you use it too much, you might notice it gets off pretty quickly. So it's, they're easy to calibrate. Uh, one way to do it is to just put it into a cup of ice water, like make, make an ice slurry and temp it to zero. Um, so instead of going into all of that, I've just put a link here to a, a fact sheet on thermometers in general from the FSIS. It's actually a really good site about all kinds of information about thermometers as well as the method for calibrating. Okay, so that was our cooking. When it comes to holding and serving food, so sometimes we've cooked something but we're not serving it right away. Uh, we might be holding it on um, a hot bar type of situation, uh, you know, depending on your, your organization's capacity. We're holding it for a time um, before serving it. That is okay as prior we're doing it at the correct temperatures. So you want to hold hot food, so something that you've cooked, at least at 135, not higher. If you're holding cold food for service, 41 or below. Again, use a thermometer to check the food's internal temperature. If you've got something that's been sitting out holding that has not maintained the correct cold or hot temperature, um, and if you can't correct that quickly, I mean, if it's in a short, very short time frame that the temperature has dropped, you can still correct it. But if it's been too long, you're going to have to discard that food. When you are serving food to your customers, your clientele, we don't want to have bare contact with our hands. We want to wear gloves, tongs, or appropriate utensils. You want to use different utensils for each item and then clean and sanitize those utensils between tasks or if it's in there continuously once every four hours. Uh, if you put food that's prepared at a different site and delivered to a service location, I don't know if anybody really does that, but every now and then um, there are programs, um, usually like childcare and things like that, that prepare food in a main site and then deliver it to another location. So I just thought I'd mention it in case anyone's familiar with that. If you are doing any situation like that, food needs to be packed in insulated food grade containers, labeled with a use by date and time, have uh, heating and service instructions, and should have that internal temperature looked at. Okay, if you've made the food and you've got some that's not being used and you wanna cool it down and store it for a later time, a couple of guidelines for that. So again, we wanna make sure as we're cooling food, that we're limiting how long it spends in that danger zone of 41 to 135. So again, that's where our bacteria likes to thrive. We actually have even greater bacterial growth between 70 and 125 degrees. So that's the really prime temperature. So my example is if you've got a big, say, stew pot or chili pot that's been heated, been served, you know, you're trying to cool the remainder down to 41 degrees so you can get it as it's in the cooler or so you can get it in the cooler. You need to do this within no more than six hours. That's the maximum amount of time. So what ServeSafe defines is that you cool food from that, it's probably at least 135 and you get it down to 70 degrees within two hours, meaning you would temp it after two hours and hopefully it's at 70. Then you gotta cool it down to 41 or lower within the next four hours. Now again, all this can happen within, the, you know, take place inside your fridge or cooler, but ideally those temperatures need to get down. If it doesn't, then you'd actually have to reheat it and start all over again. So the best way to cool food, especially again, if you have a large pot of something, is to divide it into smaller containers where they'll cool quicker. Uh, you can also create an ice water bath and put the entire pot into this ice water bath in order to cool it down. Another appropriate method, if you've ever seen these cool plastic ice paddles, you can actually fill these with water and then freeze it and then stir the food item with it. Uh, 
Number three, most people probably don't have this, but as a blast chiller, this is a unit that blasts cold air over food and very quickly chills it down. Now these are usually larger food service operations that have very large amounts of food. So again, probably not something that's really accessible to most of us. So your best bet would be probably number one, dividing food into smaller containers and getting it cooled down. If you want to reheat previously cooked food, if you're going to serve it immediately, the temperature that... Okay, sorry, mice. Yes, sorry, mice. Apparently my slides were not quite keeping up pace with me. Um, you're going to reserve re food. You can heat it to any temperature, but if you're going to hold it hot and not serve it right away, it needs to be heated to at least 165. So again, a lot of temperatures. Um, so. Uh, Again, it's not necessarily necessary to memorize all of these temperatures, as long as you have a good resource that lists these things out that are appropriate to what you're actually doing at your agency. Okay, so that was kind of a quick, again, we call this basic food safety because it's not nearly as in-depth as some trainings, um, but that wraps up the continuing portion of this training of discussing food preparation. So I'm gonna pause again and see if anybody has any questions. Let me see if I can unmute you. Still don't know how to unmute everybody. <laughs> if you have questions. Function. All right, I'm gonna unmute. I think. Or unmute yourself. Okay, I think everyone's unmuted. Okay, any questions on anything in this further portion on anything related to food prep? Or again, anything, any issues that you want to discuss or share with the group? I'll give you a second. Then. A lot of temperatures. What temperatures? <laughs> There's just a lot of temperatures. A lot of temperatures, <laughs> yeah. If you take the serve safe, you're going to be beating your head against the table by the end because it's just so much information. I tried to break it down a little bit easier. Um, if you can't remember anything, remember that 41 to 135 is the, the danger zone. Danger zone, yeah. Keep temperatures out of. Oh, uh, somebody would like to review thawing. I'll do that quickly. That's a great question because that is important. I can make myself go back here. Yeah, so again, thawing food. Note, put it on the counter. And I will I come to people's houses and I say, you've got food on the counter. So, or, well, except the sink's okay. It's because there's under running, running water. Mm -hmm. Sorry if I'm, everyone's eyes are bugging out here as I flip through all of these. All right, yeah, so four ways to properly thaw food. Again, number one is simply put it in the fridge. You've taken it out of the freezer, you put it in the fridge, and you leave it. Now, this takes a while. Um, you know, depending on how large this product is, you might need to do it a day or two ahead of time and just let it thaw out that way. Number two was under the cold, cool running water in a sink that can drain. I, I use this a lot at home. I find this to be very effective. Again, as long as, you're, as long as the boyfriend's not running scalding hot water over it, then it works out just fine. Mm -hmm. If the water's a little too cool, sometimes it takes a while. Uh, number three, again, was throwing it in the microwave, but only do that when you're ready to cook it. Take it out of the microwave and immediately cook it. So we don't, again, the microwave doesn't always heat evenly, especially, again, depending on the size. You're going to have cold spots, warm spots. You don't want that sitting around because that's going to be um, potentially harmful. So if you're thawing in the microwave, cook it right away. And then number four was thawing it as part of the cooking process, meaning something comes out of the freezer and you immediately put it maybe on a low setting in the oven, but then you continue cooking it. Okay. Any other questions? Oops. Uh, yes, good point. If you are thawing it underwater, I would cook it once it's thawed, not put it back in the fridge or mm -hmm. really any thawing method. I mean, aside from just having it in the cooler. would be. Just if you it. thaw something in the fridge, is it then safe to put back in the freezer if it's been in the fridge the whole time? Mm -hmm. I know you can just flavor that way, but is it safe? Yes, actually, I believe, and I'm going to double check that before I say it to everybody, but I believe that the USDA does consider that safe. 
if it's been in the fridge and not above 40 degrees that it can then go back in the freezer. Okay. But if you've done another thawing method, you wouldn't not. Yeah, Jen's gonna look real quick. I, I know I looked at that recently and I'm pretty sure it said as long as it didn't get above 40 in the fridge, it could go back in the freezer. Jen's gonna Google that real quick and make sure I'm correct in that because I don't wanna give misinformation when it comes to something as important. Yeah, FSI, I guess, probably. While she's looking, any other questions? Yes. Okay, so yes, the question, the answer is yes, you can do that. You can put it back in the uh, freezer, but the, the caveat is that there might be a, a slight loss in quality. But safety-wise, that is totally okay. Right, right, okay. Okay, so if there's no other questions, so now I have a second quiz that Jen will post the link to. And I should have mentioned this earlier, you don't have to take this quiz right away. You certainly can if you want to while the information is still fresh. Uh, but if you don't have time and need to move on to other things, the link, the, the quiz is available. It's, it's out there, it's not going anywhere. So you just have to have that link handy though, it's somewhere saved so that you can access it when you're ready to take it. Once you can hit submit, at the end of the quiz, it'll send it to me, and that's what I will use to uh, give you a certificate of completion. Um, if I, if you don't hear from me and several days have passed, and you're like, did she get my quiz? Just send me a quick email and, and ask, because um, I wanna make sure the system should work, because I have tested this internally quite a bit, but you know, if we have any snags or whatever, just feel free to email me. I can also send you the quiz as a PDF and you can fill it out by hand if you just prefer that and mail it to me. You know, there's just plenty of options here. So the food safety quiz for food prep sites is longer than the one for pantries and it covered that beginning material as well as everything I have just covered since. You still need to get an 80% to pass, so 27 out of 34 questions. And again, I'll email you a certificate that's good for three years. Did you put the link up? Okay, oh, <laughs> the, the link is up. Uh, so again, you click on that, it's a Google document. Just again, make sure you put in your name, your agency name, your agency number, just so I have all the information for when I'm compiling the certificates and getting them out to the correct people. I think somebody might be asking a question here. Jen, is there a question popping up? Nope, oh, okay, sorry, S screen was flashing. Okay, if there are no further questions, I'll go ahead and sign off. I want to thank you guys for participating today. Um, I hope you found this helpful and useful. And I think it's really actually great that we were able to do it in this method as opposed to, I, I do like teaching in person. It's what I enjoy doing, but it, this is a great way to reach people as well. And I hope it works out for you as well. As, um, oh, I know, do you want to put my email in the chat? Dan's going to put my email address in the chat. And you know, I'm just realizing, I don't think I ever introduced myself at the beginning of this. <laughs> I didn't care, <laughs> the nutrition resource manager. Um, I don't think I ever actually said that when I launched into this. I think my name was on the first slide, so I, I apologize. I'm a little new to Zoom. We are all kind of feeling our way through this um, method of uh, delivery here. So any questions about anything, or again, if you're having any issues with the quizzes, just go ahead and send me an email. We're gonna make sure Jen sent the correct link. It should be 34 questions total. Oh. Be two I just noticed a lot of the questions, like all of the questions were the same. And I was like, oh, I think we just took this one. Well, the beginning questions are. So the, the beginning, um, the first 25 questions are the exact same as the pantry quiz. You just have an additional up to 34 questions that are okay. on the new material. So yeah, it's gonna look the same when you first open it. What if okay. I don't know my agency number? Yeah, if you don't know your agency number, that's fine. Just put your name. Okay. The name of your agency, and I will find it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, for the food prep, you should have the 34 question quiz, not the 25. Gotcha. Okay, anything else? Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Um, yep, yeah, let me know if you need me for anything. Other than that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Maybe I'll see you later this afternoon on the uh, a second uh, nutrition related uh, session that we're doing this afternoon that I'll be on briefly. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Thank you.